All right, so I'm halfway through One Piece. I've read the manga and watched the dub and the sub. And before we just continue plowing through the series, I want to take a look back and do a tier list of all of the arcs that we've gone through so far. All right, first up, we have Romance Dawn. This arc does so much for me. It establishes the idea of adventure and what it means to achieve your dreams. It sets up the world government's corruption through the more individualistic corruption of Axan Morgan. I also like the cartoony look of the manga in East Blue. It's something that the later arcs just don't have, and it makes it feel extra charming to me. Now, this arc is mostly set up. Axan Morgan isn't really a threat. He's more of like a throwaway villain, so we don't really have stakes. And because of that, I'm going to give this one like a B tier. Okay, next up we got Orange Town. It is a really lovely introduction to Buggy. I heard a lot of people didn't like him, but I mean, he is, he's a character who had essentially peaked and has now just gone nothing but downhill. He's, he's an actual clown in terms of piracy. That is his role in this arc. We use this arc as a way to set up a lot of negatives for piracy, as well as showing what treasure means in the world of One Piece and how it's not exactly what we might think. So again, I love the themes of the story, but as for the actual story itself, it's kind of underwhelming. I get what Buggy's role is, but again, we don't really build up a lot of stakes here. We're kind of just cruising through most of these arcs in East Blue. That being said, I'm giving it like a D tier. It's, you know, it's cute. I'd go back and experience this again for its humble beginnings, but a lot of the later arcs are just way stronger. All right, Syrup Village. It's, again, relatively normal. Syrup Village is probably the most normal place in One Piece, and its main character there, Usopp, is essentially just an everyday kid. He could have been like an NPC in a calm island, just like a simple background character, and we wouldn't have noticed, but I think it's because he chooses to go out into a dangerous world that I end up loving Usopp so much. This arc also has the Going Merry, which a ton of other arcs build upon, uh, and Water 7 and Eneslavi just would not be as good without this arc. I think that this arc needed to be normal in order for future arcs to work. But you see, <laughs> uh, that comes with a problem. I've been mentioning that a lot of these arcs right now don't really establish any good threats and are less engaging than other arcs. And if people see Syrup Village and they stop watching, I totally get it. By this point, the story just needed something way stronger. And this villain is, is whack. His plans are whack. And this is probably like the weakest villain in One Piece. I also believe that just if you remove 50% of this arc, it would have been better. This didn't need to be 20 chapters. I don't think it needed to even be 10 episodes. It could have just been like one episode for the introduction, two for the fight, and one for the wrap up. It's that simple. I'm sorry, Sierra Village. Compared to other arcs, you are just like an F tier for me. Just like a clear F tier. That was brutal. I, <laughs> I absolutely butchered at Sierra Village. I'm sorry. All right, next up, we have Baratier. I'm stubborn, and I like to call it Baratier. The Baratier, or the Barity, was when I first understood just how long these sagas were going to be, considering that we were practically halfway through the saga, and we still hadn't even touched the Grand Line. Instead, we were still hyping it up with uh, the introduction of Craig over here. We got to see another glimpse of how absolutely frightening the Grand Line could be. Uh, it's also where we see uh, how strong some of the strongest characters in One Piece were going to be. We saw Zoro hit his ceiling extremely early on and how that changes him. Something that we wouldn't see happen to Luffy until hundreds of chapters later. We're introduced to Sanji and his mentality towards others. We learn about like Luffy's mentality towards adventure with uh, Zeph during this arc. I'm going to give it like an A. This is a solid arc. And Arlong Park. Arlong Park was when I finally went like, oh, this is, this is the formula for One Piece. I really love the saga because in comparison to uh, the next saga that we're going to see, this one is completely invisible. This saga needed to have a good emotional climax, but I did not expect it 
to be from Nami. It was when I understood that, oh, okay, you know exactly what you're doing with this story. It took an already interesting character for me and just added so much context to her. It shows our cast of characters not just fighting separately or having their own individual moments, but actually coming together to take down a bigger threat that impedes on their crewmates' dreams. Easy S tier. Uh, I cry every time I think about this arc. It's beautiful. And with our long bark, we have essentially wrapped everything up. Locktown acts as a nice breather, I think. You can essentially just relax and go shopping, and it's way calmer. But I think now the question is, where do we go from here? We have long-term background goals, but what about our present goals? I think Logtown here is where we learn about these new strings that are being set up. We get Buggy and Alvita and Smoker and Tashigi and Dragon, and just when it feels like these stories uh, were wrapping up, suddenly we get this and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, we're, we're just getting started. This is the prologue. It's mostly just set up, but again, easy B tier. And that leads us to Reverse Mountain, which uh, in retrospect is way shorter than almost every other arc. I think it has a lot of cool concepts for the Grand Line. I still really love the log pose and the Laboon story. It's opening up a ton of possibilities for future adventures, but that's Kind of the thing, Reverse Mountain is a pseudo arc that is used to set up a lot of the future arcs, and that's why it's a C tier. Whiskey Peaks. It is an arc where bounties of characters are really well utilized. I really love that this island is dedicated to fooling and absolutely destroying pirates. I wish we got to see more of this, just to help out some more jankier moments, like Luffy versus Zoro, that didn't fit well with me. Uh, a lot of, like, Vivi's character here uh, feels a little off, and I'm gonna give it, like, a D tier. It is an island that I look back on and think, yeah, that was part of the adventure. Next up, we have Little Garden. It just came out of nowhere. This island has both, like, giants and dinosaurs, and it expands the world again. It had Usopp claiming to be a proud warrior and connects him with the giants for future arcs. It also establishes what it means to be a true warrior in this arc. Its themes are what, like, Syrup Village uh, wanted to be. But here's the thing with a lot of early One Piece. It's stalling. The villains were weak. There's no way anyone should have lost a candle boy over here. It's another time where I could just feel the writing. We can't have Luffy win this arc because then it would be over. And so we got to put artificial barriers there, which you could just totally feel. And I don't like that feeling. I'm putting it at B tier. Let's start talking positively with Drum Island. It introduces one of my favorite characters, Dr. Kuraha, as well as Hairluck. And it is the first arc where I could actually feel uh, like I would care about Alabasta. Here in this arc, it's not just haha pirates go burr, but we also see how everyday people or even how royalty like Vivi would uh, react to a lot of these events. We see how she pleads to the people of Drum Island and how she seems to have a complex understanding of the political system that Wapol and Vivi are a part of. On Chopper and Hiraluk's side, it also has a lot of strong moments here, establishing uh, what it means to be a pirate and just putting so much emphasis on the Jolly Roger symbol and legacy that I had never thought about before. So to me, this one's like an easy, easy A tier. Now, how do I even talk? <laughs> how do I even talk about Alabasta? In this arc, I actually felt the stakes. I felt like this was an arc that maybe the Straw Hats couldn't win. That Crocodile was such an antagonizing force because he was smart. He was uh, after an ancient weapon, which would have made him even more frightening. But here's the thing, right? I feel this way a little bit for Arlong Park and Thriller Bark, but I really feel like this for Alabasta and Skypea, and that's the fact that I think we could cut like 10 to 20% of this arc, and it would be better. 
I remember the bomb in the clock tower chapter and thinking like, oh, okay, these are these are stakes. It's going to happen. And then I remember it was still uh, like ticking down. And I was like, okay, yeah, any, any day now. And, and uh, you know, next chapter, it kept ticking. And I was like, wow, these are a long five seconds. And then a character finally sacrifices themselves and that was a beautiful scene except just kidding haha they're alive that that seriously just put me in a sour mood and i didn't like the fan service near the end it felt really forced and weird so to, to alabasta you're just hanging on by a thread to me you would be in c tier but you're just you're barely clinging on to b tier for me it has a lot of redeeming qualities that I feel bad if I were to put it any lower, but I don't feel like I should put it any higher. All right, it is time to talk about Jaya. This is probably one of my favorite arcs. Jaya conceptually lays down an amazing premise and is just so short and fast paced compared to Alabasta that it was really exciting to read through. I still think about the scene where people ask Luffy where he's headed off to and he just points up and says the sky and I'm like, yes, let's go. It establishes the story of Blackbeard and Luffy as well as laying down some hard moral lessons about aspiring to your dreams and not thinking about what others think about you. And it was the most exciting feeling I have ever felt in One Piece at the time, just to be able to leave the sea and fly straight up into the air. It's beautiful. I don't get why people want you to skip this arc. Easy A tier. All right, Skypea. I'm biased. This is one of my favorite arcs. The idea was just something that I never even thought was a possibility in One Piece. And I cried of pure excitement just seeing this happen. Skypea has a lot of strong themes that we'll see again in like Ennis Lobby and Marineford, as well as having just strong connections to Roger and the Poneglyphs. I don't know why people would want to skip it. Have you no sense of adventure? The story is literally being like, hey, yo, uh, pay attention to this. That being said, um, okay, uh, if I were to be harsh on this arc, it stretches on for way too long, just like Alabasta. I feel like we could cut 10 to 20% of this arc and it would be even better. And it feels disconnected from the rest of One Piece, taking place on an entirely different sea. Like Alabasta, it has some flaws, but I love it anyways. I gotta give it a B tier. Uh, <laughs> um, long Ring, Long Land. Did I say Long Ring, Long Land? Oh boy, did I mean G8. The reason why I'm mentioning G8 and the reason why I think a lot of people tell me to watch it is because in comparison to Long Ring, Long Land, it's more interesting. It's a lighthearted story with low stakes and it's just really charming while also incorporating uh, the Aqua Laguna. Now you might be saying, what about the Akiji section? And you know what? That's true. There are a lot of interesting parts about this story on the front and back of what is essentially a filler arc sandwich. I don't hate it, but if you're watching Long Ring Long Land, it's for Foxy. Uh, if you want some fun distraction with low stakes, that's Long Ring Long Land. It's an E tier. Um, G8 gets like a C tier. If we ignore Long Ring Long Land, then the Water 7 saga is one of the most solid sagas in One Piece. It's a beautiful shift in the story, going from like a light-hearted, fun family crew on this fun, happy joyride to realizing that like, oh... We're no longer playing pirates, and this is the turning point where we have to become a real crew or just get destroyed. It's an S tier. The Ennis Lobby arc. Right after Water 7, we have the whole crew and the Galila people going after Robin and confronting CP9. It made me love all of the characters even more and made me understand a lot more of the complexities, not just of the world government itself, but also a lot of the character motivations that I just didn't think about before. It also just has a lot of beautiful moments. I probably cried in this arc more than like any other arc. And uh, I, I literally have no complaints. It is perfect as far as I'm concerned. I just wish we got to see maybe a little bit more of Usopp this arc. Uh, I don't know where he went. He just vanished halfway through the story. Anyways, S tier. 
post Ennis Lobby. It is such an info dump for as low amount of chapters as this one had. It had uh, just so much information on here. I thought I would be able to review it along with Ennis Lobby. That was not a thing that happened. Here in this arc, we learned about the Grand Line. We finally finished uh, strengthening the bond between the Straw Hats and turning them into an actual crew. We get to see uh, Kobe's glow up and also Helmet Bow's here too, I guess. It's great. This entire saga, it's perfect. I'm going to give this an A tier. Uh, no complaints. Oh, Thriller Bark. Another arc where people were telling me not to skip this one. And I don't know why. It's another one of my favorite arcs. I just love a lot of the vibes in this arc. It has a lot of good moments with a lot of the crew. And I think it's also one of the most self-contained arcs. If it wasn't for Brooke or mentioning Kaido, this could have felt like a filler arc. But come on, it had a ton of strong character moments. I love Usopp in this arc. I personally lump this arc in with Summit War Saga since a lot of the themes here are foreshadowed and are just immediately shown uh, in Saba Odi. So this gets a B tier. The Summit War Saga is, again, one of the best sagas out here in One Piece. The Saba Odi arc is beautiful. We get a lot more insight about just how hypocritical the world government can be while simultaneously getting a lot of interesting looks into how the Grand Line is perceived, both as the hardest part of your journey and also a paradise, the best part of your journey. And unlike Zoro, who was immediately hit with like the biggest L before he even made it into the Grand Line with a Mihawk, it is now Luffy's turn to get the biggest L. Except this one is going to take an entire saga with Luffy losing all of his crew and just absolutely breaking down. And this is just the start. Uh, this one, clear S tier for me. The Amazon Lily arc is where we see a mixture of Luffy's optimism and utter desperation. Apart from that, I really loved Boa as a character here, not only because she's a warlord, but because she's handled way differently than any other warlord. Luffy's an underdog here, and he's on her turf without backup. She also helps showcase the evilness of the world government. I love the whole like snake vibe from this island. Amazon Lily is also just used to build up Impel Down and the Marine Ford section. And I have no complaints about Amazon Lily. It's an A tier. Oh, Impel Down. Surprisingly varied landscapes for what's essentially a breakout story. We get to see Luffy hit the ceiling for the second time in a row with Magellan. We get some info about Dragon and the Revolutionary Army, as well as introducing Evo, one of my favorite characters here. But most of all, we get a giant reunion with like Buggy and Bon Clay and Crocodile, which is not something that I thought would happen, but it was a really surprising twist to the story. A tier. Marine Ford. Uh, this is surprisingly fast-paced, probably the shortest climax to any saga that we'll ever get. And I think as far as sagas go, this is probably one of the best. It is not only a war that has been built up, but also shows us the end game for One Piece. It is the end of a legend. It is the end of an era. It is the third time that Luffy has gone downhill and officially hit rock bottom. This is an easy, easy S tier. Do I need to say more? No. Post-war. Uh, Post-war feels bittersweet to me, the same way that like Water 7 feels bittersweet. It is the Straw Hats reforming themselves uh, into an actual crew. And this post-war section is the Straw Hats being apart the longest they have ever been apart in order to be able to train up and survive the new world. I gotta give this one an S tier. I'm very excited to see what happens when we finally get the crew back together. And that's everything I got so far. What do you think of the tier list? I know I sounded a bit harsh. Uh, I tried to be really critical of these arcs, but you don't want to know how many takes this took because explaining why I liked a lot of these arcs legitimately made me cry just thinking about them. All right, I'm doing one more video about just my predictions and thoughts on the series just before we move on to the second half. And also, thanks to the support of all of these people who I also rank in S tier. 